Hi, hello everyone. Um, I hope you're having a great uh, conference today. My name is Nguyen and welcome to this session titled Think Local, Act Global, Opportunities for Long-Term Impact by Hannah. Uh, I'm Nguyen and I'll be the MC for this session. Following Hannah's presentation, we'll move on to a live Q&A session while Hannah will respond to your questions. You can submit your questions through the swap card live discussion feature and then after 45 minutes, we'll bring the session to an end. Uh, but now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this session. Hannon is the researcher at uh, Rethink Priorities Re uh, General Long-Term Risk Team and a manager of Condor Camp. Previously, he was a pre-doctoral research fellow at the Legal Priorities Project. He holds a master in science in criminal justice policy from the London School of Economics where he was a Chevron scholar and a law degree from the Federal University of uh, Pernambuco, Brazil. So welcome, Hannah. Thank you very much, Nguyen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, right, so let's jump into it. I'm going to talk about Think Local, Act Global, and discuss some opportunities for long-term impact. You can access this presentation in the link in the bottom right. And yeah, this, this link is going to be live, so feel free to keep on using it. Cool, let me start with the bottom line. If you want to uh, take the, the key takeaway from this session, it is that I will argue that you can multiply your impact several times by using an analytical framework, and I'll mention what that framework is. And I will also argue that people from low and middle income countries are often uniquely positioned to work on certain areas. Lastly, that you can leverage your local comparative advantage to achieve globally impactful change. And I'll also explain what I mean by comparative advantage. Cool, so let's uh, proceed. Uh, this is a rough breakdown of uh, what the session will look like. I'll start talking about uh, how to make sense of one's career, then jump into what I mean by comparative advantage. And even though I will use examples from low and middle income countries, uh, I hope that this is gonna be useful for folks who are from other countries as well. And lastly, I will provoke you to think about how you can act. Let's just start. Right, I want you to take uh, one minute to think about what you think would be the best intervention to improve educational attainment for girls in sub-Saharan Africa. So there are four options, and I want to, to think about uh, improving um, this specific outcome in this specific context. And yeah, I just wanted to mention that this is based on, on research from folks from j -PAL. And uh, now that I've said a bunch of things, hopefully you've picked your choice. And let's jump into the answers. So this example is really uh, insightful, in my opinion, because it shows how impact can vary in uh, orders of magnitude, depending on the specific intervention. So you can see that among these three options, three uniforms are around 10 times more effective than conditional cash transfers for girls. Um, and this is already a pretty big difference. But what is more striking is that the fourth option, informing parents of benefits of education, is 20 times more effective than the second best option, let alone uh, the other options considered. And even though all of them looked pretty sensible on paper, there is a vast difference in practice that through research and analysis, we can spot and can dedicate our resources more effectively. Um, so this is a clearly useful way to think about how to dedicate financial resources, but I argue that this is also how you should uh, think about your career and that your impact can be several orders of magnitude greater if you approach it analytically, and especially if you think um, in a global scale. Right, so this leads to the question then, what should I work with and how to navigate a seemingly endless search space? So if I'm thinking in terms of a global scale and all of the interventions that look sensible uh, can be somewhat misleading, then what the hell should I do? And I think that a pretty well-known, probably most of you already know about this framework, but I think that it's useful to reinforce it a little bit. 
is the ITN framework, the importance, tractability, and neglectedness framework. Just a brief uh, overview of this framework, which is mainly used to pick uh, cause areas. The importance uh, is related to how many people are affected by the problem you're trying to tackle, or people, or animals, or uh, what you consider the uh, worth uh, of well-being. And another way to frame it is how much good the solving this particular problem would do. Tractability is uh, related to how much each resource, like unit of resource, tracks into solving the problem. So if we double the resources dedicated to solving this particular problem, what fraction of it would we expect to solve? Or how easy it is to track uh, resources into impact? And lastly, but not leastly, neglectedness relates to how many resources are already going towards solving this problem. And thinking about uh, your contribution at the margin, uh, which means how relevant is each uh, marginal or additional resource uh, for this particular pro pro uh, problem. And the domain reference for this that I'm using is ADK, and I'll talk about this in more detail in a few. OK, so now you've managed to go through the endless search space and you have some criteria under your belt, and you spotted that the main thing that you want to do is cause X. Right, are you the right person for that? How, how would you know? How would you be confident about this? And I want you to uh, join me in this thought experiment that was uh, put, forth, put forth by Liska. Um, what if you could work with Superman or Superwoman? Uh, they read uh, 100 words of research articles per second, and I think the average normal person, non-super person, reads something like uh, 10 to 15, or maybe I'm being too slow, uh, but definitely not even close to 100. And they can also save 10 lives per hour by flying food and water to remote locations. How, is, how useful could you be to someone so extraordinary? Um, I want you to think a little bit about this, and probably you have already uh, come up with some good answers. Um, probably you won't be able to read as fast, but as Superman is flying all over the world to deliver food and water, you're doing uh, a little bit of research, uh, a little bit slower, but helping. And when uh, Superman comes back, you tell them uh, where they should fly food and water next, or you were getting the food and water, uh, you, you're buying it and made it, making it more easily available to Superman. Uh, so what I mean by this is that you, if you spot the right way to help, you can be super impactful. And this is related to the concept of comparative advantage. And I really like this quote by Ben West. Sometimes the world needs a 40th percentile graphic designer at an EA effective altruist organization more than the best possible person working on a really obscure database in some random organization. So it's not only about you being the better, or the best on whatever you're working with, but uh, you have to approach it analytically and find what are the best uh, interventions that you can work with. And I'm really excited about comparative advantage, as you can see by the rainbows uh, near the, the, the concept. Um, but right. Um, just a little bit more reference. This is a concept brought uh, from economics that was originally uh, put forth by David Ricardo. And in these uh, images that I just plucked from Wikipedia, where you can read more, um, it is better for both England and Portugal if they split and work on what they're best than for England to do both, even though England is by itself best in cloth and wine. Um, it's better for it for England to specialize in wine and Portugal to specialize in cloth, and it's better for everyone involved. So I think this is a pretty useful concept to think about our own careers. Cool. But how does this relate to uh, our careers and especially people from low and middle income countries? So I argue that your local background often makes you uniquely advantaged in comparison to others. Uh, and can help you achieve global impact with change if you keep an eye out for local opportunities that have global impact. What do I mean by that? So here's a long list. Maybe you're familiar with it. Uh, this is 80,000 Hours, a uh, website that I heavily uh, suggest you, heavily recommend you check. 
and they suggest some cause areas that everyone in the world should focus on. Um, and maybe you're familiar with this. Uh, if you're not, definitely check it out. Um, and there are many things. And one default way would be just go through the list like in each order. So just try the first thing, try the second thing, try the third thing, and so on. Um, but I think that if you think about your individual comparative advantage, you will be able to power through this list of options much more sensibly and potentially impactfully. Let me give you some examples. Let's start with catastrophic pandemic. So one, does, one example of default recommendation would be to prevent gain of function research. Uh, gain of function research is basically getting dangerous uh, pathogens to be more dangerous so we can figure out how dangerous they are. And not surprisingly, this is a very bad idea. Um, so this is a default recommendation, but sometimes you're not close to a lab that is doing this kind of research, or you don't even know what the hell they're talking about when they say gain of function research. Um, but there are pro possibly other levers that if you think about your specific background, you can leverage. Uh, one example is making use of low-hanging fruits for domestic implants. Um, so way, one way to fight uh, pandemics is using public health systems. And the people from the US sometimes probably can't use this because as I've heard, the US doesn't really have a pretty strong uh, public health system. But people from other countries like uh, Brazil, where I come from, uh, there are pretty strong public health systems there. And these systems might potentially be used to uh, sequence uh, patients and then detect risky pathogens early. Um, so this is one example of something that would be different from the de default recommendation. Let's jump into another example, uh, building effective altruism, which is the third in ADK's list. So one example of default recommendation for me, uh, let's zoom into uh, what I've been up to. Uh, so I'm a general long-termist, uh, I'm a generalist researcher in long-termism at Rethink Priorities. And I've been doing this kind of research uh, as we think and other in legal priorities projects for about two years now. So the default recommendation for me would probably be keep doing your thing, keep doing research. And I'm pretty excited about this. But perhaps there are other things that if I zoom in to uh, my comparative advantage, I could be better at, or at least better at the margin. And one example would be to access uh, untapped talent in Brazil. Um, so I could, for instance, uh, I'm one of the few Brazilian EAs. Uh, sadly, we are a small community as of today, but hopefully we're going to become a pretty big community in the near future. And there is still a lot of untapped talents there. So one way, uh, so uh, it seems that in the community, at least, I'm particularly well suited to support local talent and, for example, find the best computer science centers and get them to work on AI safety, um, especially because in Brazil, uh, it's uncommon for the best talent to just go to another country. Many people just stay in Brazil, and this is a cultural particularity. Uh, or I could find experts and connect them to the best opportunities. And this is something that I considered uh, and I ended up doing. And now I'm working as a manager at this project called Condor Camp. And you can see in the bottom right that I'm there in the photo with a bunch of uh, pretty brilliant uh, Brazilian university students. And hopefully we're going to get some of them to work the most pressing problems. And this is likely something that only a few people could do. And even I'm pretty, I like to think of myself as pretty good at research. Uh, this seems like a particular opportunity that I could make uh, the best of. And few other people could, or maybe no one other could. And let me give you another example. This is space governance, and it is further down ADK's list. But maybe there are some particular opportunities you could uh, um, leverage this cause area. And I have an example. I used to work at the Legal Priorities Project, and I have background in law. And we were working on our research agenda and investigating things that would be useful for lawyers to work on. And space law and governance seemed like one of the best things that we could do. And as I was investigating this, I had no background in space law. But it looked, I quickly learned as I spoke with experts that there were only a few people in Brazil that had a strong background in space law. And I connected with uh, one space law professor. 
joined this small group of space law, uh, people interested in space law, and quickly got into the group that was giving talks and influencing space law legislation in the country. Uh, so this is me. I'm the last one mentioned in that flyer, but I was giving a presentation on a really specific piece of space law legislation in Brazil. It didn't take uh, it didn't take up too much of my time, and this was a pretty low hanging fruit uh, to influence a relevant jurisdiction in that matter. Um, so one example of default recommendation for space governance would be to pursue a career as a diplomat or at the UN, which is something that I haven't uh, worked towards. But an alternative would be keeping an eye out for low hanging fruits and just uh, trying to influence um, domestic policy that would have an impact in international policy. So my example is specific towards space governance, but other areas that I would be very excited for people to think about this would be strengthening the biological weapons convention, um, nuclear weapons regulations, AI regulations, and these are things that possibly are low-hanging fruits in relevant jurisdictions outside the US and the UK. So the bottom line here is that as long as you keep global impactful change in mind, thinking about your comparative advantage can take you a long way. I gave three categories of examples, low-hanging fruits in domestic policy, also in international policy, such as the space law thing, and access to untapped talent. Right, so how can you specifically act? So I'd like you to take two minutes to think about what next steps you can take. Please write down some concrete, as the most concrete, the better, uh, next steps that you can take in light of what, we, what I just presented. So I list some ideas and feel free to get inspiration from this, but feel, also feel free to um, yeah, be creative. And I'll say something in two minutes. Cool. I think that's it. And feel free, I know this is a short time, but feel free to continue this exercise after the presentation. And just reiterating the bottom line, thinking locally can help you act globally. You can usefully make use of your local background to leverage your comparative advantage towards globally impactful change. I hope this was useful for you. Feel free to reach out to me via this email on the screen or through its swap card. And thank you very much for your attention and time. Thank you so much for the presentation. And um, so we haven't got a uh, during the we haven't got any question in swap card yet. But um, while we're waiting for more audience to submit, I, I just want to ask if you have any helpful resources or any recommended readings that you would uh, give for others who also want to do more. Um, global work, but with a local um, mindset. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Nuin. Um, I think that one of the best resources could be uh, if you look up the EA forum for Angela uh, LMIC. So Angela Arisizabal, 
wrote this uh, forum post on uh, the like local priorities and how to uh, how for people from low middle income countries to be helpful and uh, contextualize this. And I think this is a pretty good uh, EA forum post. Um, also, another advice would be uh, definitely try to att attend, if you can, any AJAX in person. And we're now going to have a bunch of them all over the world, in Mexico, uh, in the beginning of next year, in India as well. Um, so, yeah, I think this, this can be two useful things for each two. Thank you so much. Um, I think for EAs um, in non-EA hubs, it's really hard to work on global priorities um, or global causes when you're um, not in a place where there are resources or people you can talk to or uh, the, the environment is not desirable to work on those causes. Um, how about you? Can you share more about your personal story about how you made up your mind to work on these uh, global causes and how did you find the opportunities yourself? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I agree with you. So I first learned about EA in back in 2017. And as I said, there aren't uh, many EAs. There weren't any EAs in my city. I think that uh, this is still the case. So I mostly got involved online. But I think that one of the things that were useful that I ended up doing was uh, developing a bunch of um, transferable skills. So I wanted to uh, do research. And I started focusing quite heavily on methods. So my original um, format, uh, degree is in law. And law uh, doesn't really have any methods courses, at least in my university. So that's why I ended up pursuing a master's in criminology. And I focused quite heavily on like intro to stats and some advanced stats. And then at, um, I think this position be well for a like internship or like fellowship intro position, uh, which was what I did at the Legal Priorities Project. And um, my move from criminology towards uh, long-termism was also quite motivated by this trying to think globally uh, mindset. Um, so after a year studying criminology, I was uh, slightly disillusioned with the um, scope of the impact that I could have and the tractability of the impact I could have. Um, and so when the opportunity came to work with long-termism, I thought that this would be a pretty good thing to try out. And it turned out that I did this for a year and a half and ended up applying to PhDs. And also at the same time that I got into a PhD program, I also got an offer from Rethink Priorities and chose to do direct research instead of going into a program. So also, to, also with the mindset of, um, maximizing the scale of my impact and the tractability. And yeah, this is a little bit of, about my background. And I think that definitely transferable skills helped me along the way. Oh, I see. So the key here is to gain more transferable skills in your local context and um, look up to the global causes with, um, with your uh, comparative local advantage. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that definitely helped me was um, keeping an eye out for things in Brazil, for instance, with the space law example that I gave. Um, so I think that it helped me get a better sense of the uh, field by connecting with other space players from Brazil, um, because it was much easier for me. Uh, folks were, were much more welcoming, and I got into this group with like weekly meetings. Um, also, yeah, like giving and preparing these kinds of presentations about space law for other lawyers in Brazil. These were things that made me upskill quite quickly and that people who uh, wouldn't be from Brazil probably wouldn't have had this opportunity. And also, had I not connected with this local um, network, I probably would have upskilled uh, much more uh, slowly. Mm, awesome. Oh, we have some more questions in the chat. Um, one person from Brazil asked, uh, how could we work on nuclear problems locally if they're from Brazil? Yeah, that's a pretty good question. So I think that the main lever for nuclear policy coming from Brazil is the role that Brazil plays internationally as a influential country and like regional leader. Um, so there are 
definitely nuclear is a particularly uh, mainstream topic but i think that um the my outsider perspective because i'm not an expert specifically in nuclear would be that um i can't think of any long-termist uh nuclear people in brazil uh so this you would probably be a bridge between the broader long-termist community and brazilian policymakers um I can think only of a few uh, people with like a legal background or a policy background that are specifically specialized in nuclear, especially because um, up until this year, nuclear was uh, nuclear risk was getting like smaller and smaller, and uh, sadly, it's not the case anymore. So um, yeah, like if you are a long termist for um, two years, if you have been long termist for two years, you would already know that nuclear is a particularly relevant lever and would have um, possibly be placed in like uh, relevant circles in Brazil and could have a say now in the international scenario. Thank you. Um, Burke asks, uh, so as we uh, work on local causes, we tend to look for lower hanging fruits and would that cause us to be biased towards um, causes that um, that relatively have less impact, but faster achieve and more tractable? That's a pretty good question. Uh, thanks for that. So I think that the current landscape is um, we devalue local priorities too much. And that's the point of this talk, trying to push the needle a little bit on the other direction. I think there is a lot of value in developing these transferable skills that I was uh, talking about, uh, developing your network and gain career capital. But you're definitely right that there is a shortcoming. If you don't think globally, then you end up going to be, you're, then you will end up focusing on things that are only locally impactful. So it's a diff difficult balance to strike, and I think the community is more lean, like not in the ideal place yet, and that's the point of this presentation. But you shouldn't shouldn't definitely like just go straight full local priorities, in my opinion. Hmm. Um. Thank you. So, uh, TJ asks. What do you think about people in LMICs going into politics in their respective nations so that they can exert influence over policy? Yeah, so I think that um, I'm pretty excited about this uh, to the extent that you think you're a pretty good fit to endure going into politics, which is um, as an outsider again, because I've never been into politics, um, quite challenging and demanding. Uh, another caveat is if you have reason to believe that the uh, position that you're running uh, for is going to have any um, like globally impactful or like out, out of the uh, very local scope um, impact. So this might be the case for, for instance, some really specific uh, states within, uh, for example, India or in Brazil. Uh, there are some, like a handful of states that are able to influence national policy and governors of states or mayors of certain particular cities can have a national level or international level impact. So if you think that these two things are in your favor, then I think I'm excited about this. Um, definitely in the sense of, I think there are fewer people than is the optimal in the community uh, thinking and acting on, along the, the lines of um, electoral politics. Thank you. Uh, Emin, um, follow up on the previous question on uh, local causes. And he asks, what do you think about the assumption that everything has marginal diminishing returns might prevent us on working on problems that are not low hanging fruit, but might have a tremendous amount of impact after uh, working on the problem for a while? Yeah, that's a pretty good question. Um, definitely the, mar the diminishing returns are varied, quite varied, depending on the intervention and the problem that you're focusing on. Um, and But I think that there is a lot of value in you that everyone should do this, is like think about themselves, their careers, as part of a larger portfolio and try to understand the cause areas as like with the, their uh, particularities, like um, is this something that has um, 
heavily diminishing returns? Or is this something that we would benefit from just having more and more people and resources? And then there is like a threshold that we can go over and uh, accomplish something great. So this is, might be the case, for instance, with AI safety. And we're definitely far from um, like a big threshold. Um, but yeah, like uh, having a bunch of people working on this uh, from varied contexts and uh, different backgrounds and um, yeah, trying to like crack the problem. Uh, this might not be the case with other uh, interventions, but yeah, it's very context dependent. Mm. Um, there's another question on LMIC. Nikki asks, how well do you think EA principles are received in LMICs in comparison to wealthier countries? Is it harder to encourage a global mindset among people who may on average have less economic security or are focused on socioeconomic issues in their own country? Yeah, thanks for, for this question. It's definitely hard, harder to just like get doing good better and give to someone and it makes sense. Yes, of course I will earn to give with uh, Brazil, for instance, is I think the second most devalued currency in the world last year. So it doesn't make any sense trying to get rich in Brazil because you will probably still not be as impactful as you could in other jurisdictions. Um, so I think that there is um, a lot of value still in like trying to ad adjust uh, EA principles. I don't think that they are completely different from most cultural norms. So the earning to give part and just donate uh, a lot of things that you have is probably one of those um, like difficult points to translate. But it, it's just part, like, part of a broader message. And if you focus on the core of the message, which I think is more related to um, try to think uh, strategically about the good that you're doing and what exactly you're trying to accomplish and try to do better. Um, I think this is related to a bunch of uh, cultural norms and even like religious values in different places. Um, and this is part of the effort, I think, at least of what I'm trying to do in Brazil and Latin America, and that I hope that and and I yeah hope that other folks are doing in other countries as well. By the way, happy to strike up conversations and discuss things like this. This is really up my alley and my uh, work. So yeah, keep those uh, questions coming on or reach out to me after the session. Yeah, um, so there's currently no other question in the chat. Um, but I, I'm also curious, uh, when you were doing more uh, global researches or uh, researching the causes in your own local context, do you refer to your um, local papers or uh, resources in your own language? And do you think it would be helpful for uh, EA um, uh, the EA space to expand into more diverse languages and uh, tap on the uh, resources or the researches that are not um, centric, uh, that are not for English speaking countries? Uh, yeah, that's a pretty great question. So I think that sadly I haven't referenced um, in my EA work uh, research in Portuguese that much, but I think this is a product of just like the vast majority of research being written in English as like the global language and the most important journals and so on. Um, related to EA specifically, I think that we are still far from op optimal in regard to content in different languages. Um, so for instance, it's quite difficult to translate long-term ASMA in other languages. There, there, has been, uh, there have been a couple of EA forum posts about it and currently the Portuguese for, version for long-termism is just longo termismo, which isn't something that I think anyone would say. Um, so yeah, I think there is, there is still a lot of work to do. Maybe um, more on the side of content creation rather than uh, research, because I think that a mm -hmm. uh, huge chunk of the value of research is um, that it, like many, most people, or the most people possible are able to read it it's probably preferable to keep research in English, um, but definitely content and thinking about how con key concepts translate into different languages. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
Oh, so I think there we're going to have one more question from Emin. Do you know any good resources or frameworks to adapt to LMICs for local priorities research? Please give it. Uh, uh, yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that um, the importance, tractability, and neglectedness framework is um, applicable to local priorities as well. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's a pretty flexible framework and also pretty useful. But the, the key thing is that since it's pretty flexible, it's also quite varied. So the challenge is how do you operationalize importance or how do you operationalize um, tractability? So if you take two interventions like diabetes, um, like curing diabetes and uh, preventing pandemics, the operationalization of both is going to be quite different. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, like curing a disease, like treating patients, qualities, pandemic prevention is probably going to be somewhat related to X risks and the value of humanity keeping existing. Uh, it can also possibly be translated into qualities, but not as faithfully as diabetes would be. Um, so yeah, as you think about your local uh, context, I, I would recommend using the ITN framework but tailoring it to uh, exactly what you're working on. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I think that's the end of our uh, session today. Uh, after around two hours, there would be another panel about local priorities research. If you're interested uh, by Vedihi, Brian and Yang from um, India, Singapore, uh, Philippines, and Malaysia, which will be very exciting. Yeah, so look forward to that. And I'll see you very soon. Uh, enjoy your conference. Thank you very much.